Hey folks, I'm so excited to be here with you. Thank you so much, Nick and Chris. It's a pleasure. Um, we're just going to get started to just set, set our intention for the day. Just jump in the chat and share. Uh, this is what we're going to be talking about right here today. We're talking about the brain on school and how traditional education just suffocates the brain's natural way of learning. Um, all of these slides and all the resources are available right there on that special website made specifically and specially just for you. So if you want to grab a screenshot of that, I'll share it a couple more times as well. I know my name is a little bit of a handful. Uh, it's Liesl. It rhymes with diesel, if that helps. Or if you're a big Sound of Music fan, uh, Liesl comes from the Sound of Music. Who I got to see some head nods there. That's right, some head nods. She was the oldest daughter in the Von Trapp family who uh, snuck out and was leaping around the gazebo. So I think just part of my namesake is some inherent rebellion to uh, to systems and structures. And you'll hear a little bit more about that as we move on uh, in our time together today. So, but in just to set our intention in the chat, if you could just go ahead and take a moment to reflect on your day today, we're about halfway, well, I'm about halfway through my day, I'm here in California, and just share in the chat, what has been the highlight of your day so far? Something really good that's happened, something you're grateful for, some fun things showing up here in the chat right now. Um, as you are reflecting and sharing on that, uh, something I'm feeling really grateful for today is uh, right now in this moment, I'm feeling really grateful for, for Nick and Chris, our hosts at the Human Restoration Project, for uh, taking a little bit of a risk and a leap of faith. I um, could, on the surface, as someone who translates cognitive neuroscience, could be an interesting fit for a conference like this. But uh, I'm really excited to be here and for that vote of confidence and faith in what I have to share today. So look at all this wonderful things. Thank you, everyone, for sharing all this goodness. You can keep sharing all of that. Um, and you might be wondering why, as someone who, as I said, translates cognitive neuroscience for a living with teachers, I am a teacher and I share with teachers, why would we take some time and limited time we have to share something that we're grateful for? And just take a look, take a look at this list right here and just reflect on which of these would you predict that there are like really strong evidence to support the practice of gratitude leading to these benefits? Which of those would you say there's credible evidence for? We got some really quick minded people here today. Yes, it, it, it's obvious. It's an all of the above. It is all of them. Now, how, like, how and, and why does that happen? Well, here's what's happened. What's going on in your brain when you take a moment to reflect on what you're grateful for is that you are activating the attentional system of your brain. Now, the attentional system of your brain, it's biased, meaning it, you know, it has its preferences. And so it is biased towards things that are really important to them, that it cares about, and in other ways. This is why your students um, might be more interested in why they often choose like social media on their phones over the lesson that's being taught to them. It's because the bias, the inherent bias of the attentional system of the brain. Now, the brain is also biased towards negativity. And that sounds really depressing, but it's just the reality of how we are wired and how our brains are formed. And it's to ensure our survival. And so what that means is that if whatever is going to help us survive, we're naturally going to pay attention to that more, which is why we can end up with a world full of just tons of negativity unless we pause and take a moment to notice all the good around us, to notice the good things that are happening, all the amazing things that have happened in your life so far today, which is why we want to take these moments for ourselves and with our students to take moments to pause and be grateful for things and um, share some highlights of our day. Now, the main message here, the takeaway message is that you can intentionally shift the bias in your brain which is a really powerful and empowering belief to, to hold true. And it's based on the science of neuroplasticity. And neuroplasticity is the science that says our brains can change. Hey, great. So our brains can change. The brain that you woke up with this morning will be different than the brain that you go to sleep with tonight. And this gives us hope. 
it gives us hope that the, the things that we're trying to do, the changes that we're trying to make personally, systemically in our schools with our students, it's all possible. And it doesn't just apply to the academic content that we are asked to teach. This is one of my favorite quotes right here from um, the latest book that I have written. And I just love to sharing it with, with teachers that says, I think it'll resonate with this group right here. Uh, my favorite paragraph in the whole book that I wrote says this, is the influence of neuroplasticity is not contained in the classroom. It extends into our social interactions and society as a whole. It is neuroplasticity that reminds us that the bad relationship habits we picked up from our parents can be unlearned and new healthier habits can be learned. Looking forward to the day when people no longer have racist, sexist or homophobic beliefs at the most basic structural level our brain's biology it is neuroplasticity that will get us there and so this is why i have spent the last 25 years studying the human brain because i think it's at the foundation of the change that we want to create in ourselves and in our education system is being able to understand our brain, how it operates, and how we can use that to create the world that we want to create. So the essence of neuroplasticity is to create learning, to create change in us. Now, as someone who has studied the brain for quite a while, it has been my experience in the world of education that the, hum the humanity of the learner is often lost in the discussion of the science of learning. I'm seeing this more now than ever, as you hear people talking about the science of reading and the science of math, right? And they're really deep into the science of, of this or the science of that. And um, I, I feel like I'm going through this like weird identity crisis because I, I do not um, associate or relate to, to those groups. Um, but again, I do study the science of learning, but I feel like the key component missing there is the humanity of the learner. Now, also on the other end of the spectrum, if I, if you could allow me to be a little bit um, dichotomous right here, is that sometimes the science of learning is lost in the discussion of the humanity of the learner. So I live this really strange existence in my work in education where I kind of like to straddle the fence and be in both worlds and try to help us understand each other and communicate and find ways to um, support our students, because that's ultimately who we're here to serve. So the way I view brain-based learning, which is the title of my latest book, is that it really is a student-centered approach to learning and to teaching. You see, when we understand the brain's natural way of learning, then we can create schools and classrooms and structures and activities to maximize their learning. Because ultimately, that's our goal. Our ultimate goal is deep, meaningful learning for our students. Now, sometimes people think like, oh, we're just talking about content. No, no, no. It doesn't matter whether you're teaching exponents or empathy. The systems and structures of the brain are the same. And so we often narrow in on the actual student and we're like, all right. So here's what they need. They need a growth mindset. They need grit and they need this and they need that and they need this skill and that tool. And that's how we're going to get to this deep, meaningful learning. And too often we forget about the systems and the structures and the context in which learning happens. And what I'm hoping to help us understand today is that there are so many elements of the systems and the context that students are learning in today that are so um, contradictory to the brain's natural way of learning. I'd love to pull back the curtain, help us see what's going on, as well as offer some solutions on how we can make schools better for our students. So let's just jump right in because the reality is you can't muscle your way out of a systemic problem. We can't like you can't have a student like, oh, they just need more grit, more if they had more motivation, if they could just focus more. Like, no, when we put all of the responsibility on our students to thrive and exist in an oppressive system, that's just almost even more oppressive. 
And so we have to take a look at how we design our schools and how we design our classrooms so that they have space to thrive. So let's just jump right into it and let's just talk about why school is so hard, so hard for the brain. We make it so hard, it's crazy. Why is it so hard? So this is going to help answer questions that you have had probably since the beginning of your career. Things, challenges that you had before um, the pandemic started, before climate crisis became a, a really obvious uh, factor for us, before so many other things, um, violence in schools, this is going to answer so many questions and it's especially going to help you understand why things have been so incredibly challenging in the last few years. So let's check this out. We're going to take a look at, okay, so here we go. Let's talk about the brain for a second, more than a second. The brain, whoop, I'm here, and I'm pushing the wrong button. Okay, so the brain is a network of systems that all work together. There's the attentional system that we talked about briefly already this morning. Um, and uh, what it pays attention to and how it's, it's biased. There's the motivational system, what motivates the brain, what demotivates the brain. There's the memory system, how memories are formed, how memories are forgotten. There's the parasympathetic system that manages our stress levels and the burnout that so many teachers are experiencing. There's all these different systems. And I mean, we could spend our time together today and I could dissect each one of those systems and I could tell you what motivates your students, what demotivates them, what do they pay attention to with their attentional system and how to design lessons to so they'll be pay attention better and how they can remember things and not forget everything and you reteach it right before state testing. And I do spend a lot of time. I spend a lot of time working with schools doing just that. Uh, but for today, I want to take a different look because even if we you had all of that knowledge and 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 like implemented it perfectly there's still going to be challenges because of the context in which these students are, are learning the schools that we design so we're going to take a look at what i call the brain's three like their dominant operating systems so you have your your iphone right or whatever phone you use and um, you have all the different apps. So that could be like your memory system and the intentional system and the parasympathetic nervous system and all that thing. But like the actual phone and how it works, like it's the motherboard, the operating system. We're going to take a look at three of the dominant operating systems of the brain and how they are matching or mismatching what's happening in most of our schools. Let's jump right into it. The first one is something we talked briefly about already, survival. The, the brain is designed for survival, not formal academic learning. This doesn't make me a lot of friends when I go around traveling the world as an education uh, speaker and consultant and author, like, hey, I'm the brain lady and sorry, it does not, it's, it's not meant for academic learning. It never was been. It's designed to keep us alive, to perpetuate our species so that we do not die off. And yet here we are trying to like force all of this like content knowledge into these young undeveloped brains all day long. It's completely backwards. So with a brain that's designed for survival, here's why. So many students, you hear your students saying, Ugh, can you just like tell me what I need to do to pass? Just, just tell me what I need to do to pass and I'll do it. Because passing is surviving. And like, I, I just want to pass. This is also why you'll see students who will shrink or puff up whenever their social status is in question. Because surviving for many tweens and teens also means being able to maintain their social status. Surviving socially in school is an underappreciated need for, for, our to, for our youth. Being able to survive socially. 
And so if this is how we are just wired, this is how we're built, we're designed to survive, then how do we, like, what does this look like? Like, what does it look like? What does survival typically look like in schools? Think back to when you had students at your school, jump in that chat. What does it look like to survive? Aside from like, oh, like, what do I need to do to pass? Like just this obsession with passing or like graduating. How do I just move on and get to the next level of this game called school and, and get over it and get through it and, and make it out alive? What else do you see? Can I go to the washroom? Just like, I just need to escape and run away for a safer place. Don't want to get too much attention. Right. Okay. So I remember being a young teacher back in the 90s. And um, I was so annoyed, so annoyed by the student. who And I, and I, most of my career, I've spent teaching math, high school math. And so, of course, the question I got most often is, when am I ever going to use this? And that's alluded to several times here in the chat. And I used to be so annoyed by that student until I started learning more about them and their brain and how it runs our lives. And then I've had my own paradigm shift that like, dang, that student might be like, a, like they're onto something here. It's, I now hear that question. I used to hear it as like, just so annoyed by it. And now I hear it as a neurobiological cry for relevance. Like, please, 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 please tell me why this is important, why this is relevant, because I believe that at some unconscious level, we know that if we can find the relevance to our content, if our students can find the relevance to the content, then all sorts of amazing things happen in the brain in terms of attention and motivation and learning and all the things that we want. And so that's just a really important shift. So does this relate to the, to the fight or flight? The social survival definitely does because I'm either going to like hunker down. I'm not going to raise my hand, uh, hood up, earphones in, go to the bathroom. I'm going to flight and run away from this oppressive space, or I'm going to talk back to my teacher and I'm going to fight because you are demeaning me right now and you are um, you are putting my social status in question and how I appear to my peers is so important to me. And if you can't elevate all of us to have the equal value in our voice in this space, then I, as an underdeveloped young person, I will most certainly try to put myself in a position that, that makes my social status safe. So with all of this about like, what is survival? Like, what is it looking like? You have great examples. That's exactly what it looks like every day in classrooms. What do we do? Like, how can we create a human-centered design knowing that survival is critical? We can't, we're not going to change how the brain is, is wired. Sorry, I wish. Trust me, I got a long list of things that I wish I could change. Uh, that's not going to happen. So knowing that we're designed to survive. How are you, what are you pushing for in your schools? How can you design knowing that survival is paramount? And as you're thinking about that, um, I'll share a few. I'm just going to share a few. There's a lot that can be shared. Um, first and foremost, one, we have to redefine survival for schools. The purpose of school is not to just graduate. The purpose of school is not to, the purpose of my class is not to pass the class and move on to the next class. The purpose of school is not to just like get as much information into my brain that 80% of it is probably useless. We need to redefine what survival means and that's going to take us some time and that's something that you in your own classroom can have influence over. If you're a classroom teacher, if you were an administrator at a school, what an amazing position to be in right now. But even within your own classroom, like you can clearly state from day one, this is why we're here. 
This is not why we're here. This is why we're here. And to reiterate that throughout the school year. So really being purposeful as we look at summer coming to a close and looking at moving into the start of the school year, what are you going to say the first day of school with your students, knowing that they have years and years and years of neural programming, telling them that school means da 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 that that takes a lot of work to undo. So trust me, you'll need to say it more than once. Two, daily relevance. Relevance is key for survival. So whatever the brain deems as being highly relevant, that's what it'll pay attention to. And it'll activate the attentional systems and all these things. So if students, this is like the, why do we have to learn this student? If we can't find daily relevance in our content, we need to find some help. We need to ask a colleague to help us. We need to ask um, like uh, an instructional coach, an admin, help me find why this is relevant. If we're teaching something that is irrelevant to students, my question is, why are you teaching it? Why are you teaching it? And then building those social connections. Some of my favorite educational researchers talk about uh, the research they've done on this and how if you want to really improve graduation rates, the single biggest factor is to make sure every student has a friend. Make sure every single student has a friend. When in the work that I do and that I have done, so a couple of quick examples. One, I have a former student who has gone on to be a high school math teacher herself. She teaches up in the Portland, Oregon area. And she is just, she's killing it way better than I ever was. And she is teaching a geometry class. And her entire geometry course is designed around something that's highly relevant to her area and to her students. They spend the entire course building tiny homes for people in Portland who are experiencing homelessness because it is an issue in the area. It's something their, her students care about. And you can learn geometry through that. And so like, it is highly relevant. Um, some work that I've done, I had the incredible opportunity to spend a few years studying the school system in Scandinavia. And I lived in Copenhagen, Denmark for a few years. And while I was there, ended up starting a brand new school. And with everything that I knew at the time, the best of what I knew, this was 10 years ago, we're in our 10th year, and um, the school is turning some heads in Europe. We have royalty from all over, um, all over Europe visiting our school on a regular basis. And what we have done is we have built an entire school around social emotional learning. We teach personal development and social competencies. We teach personal leadership and social competencies. We teach it through the context of Danish. We teach it through the context of science. We teach it through the context of math, but our main objectives, like our main learning goals are personal, lead, personal development and social competencies. And everything that happens in the school, we have designed the whole school around that. And. Um, I mean, the data speaks for itself. We're not going to get into that right now. Um, so let's just take a moment right here. We're talking about this first operating system of survival. Let's pause, unmute, chat it up, talk it out loud. What are your thoughts? And as you think about this, like what is one adjustment that you think you could make in your sphere of influence to align with the brain's desire for survival? What questions are coming up? What ideas are you having? or any big ahas. I'll chime in, but I can't turn my video on because of wireless connection. No worries. Um, I love survival because we're human. It totally acknowledges the humanness of each of us, our shared humanity, everybody's stories, and that those questions get to come up in a classroom and we get to co-create a common understanding of what it means to be a human in a classroom in 2023 at whatever geographic location we are. So love it. Yeah. Yes. And you see, yes, this, looking at the, um, at the chat here, this is the science that supports students being able to co-create learning experiences with our students because they know what matters to them. And, and when we design around that, 
so much of the motivation and the, the distraction, the attention and focus, those issues just dissolve when you really have students co-creating and you're designing with your students in mind and with them as um, critical partners in that. And sometimes, I mean, I'll just speak for myself. I used to, like, I, I believe this for a long time. And I was like, yeah, you know, this seems a lot, lot easier at the secondary level. But um, I have three children of my own. And I've seen it happen in my kids' kindergarten class of students co-creating high-level, valuable learning experiences, even at the kindergarten level. So just let's be mindful of whatever biases we have as well in terms of like ageism when it comes to students being able to co-create as well. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Those social connections being intentional of how you will create those social connections, not just the first week of school, but continuing to build those social connections more so now than ever. Okay, let those conversations continue. Let those thoughts continue. And let's take a look at the brain's second operating system. This We're talking ease, folks. <laughs> The brain seeks to expend less energy when possible. We're not lazy. We're not lazy. We're survivalists. We're trying to survive. This is survival. You don't say this to a cheetah. Like, oh, you lazy cheetah. No, the cheetah sleeps 20 plus hours a day. Are you going to tell the cheetah it's lazy? No way, because that cheetah, when it's done resting, it's going to get up and it's going to sprint 75 miles an hour when it matters. When it matters, which goes back to how are we making our classrooms being places where mattering is happening? How's that for great English? Where matters. You get the meaning, right? You know what I'm trying to say. So this is because the brain is dominated by a desire for ease. This is why you see students like, oh, just tell me how to do it, please. Just show me how to do it and then I can do it. It's like this, this pull towards mimicry. Just, just tell me how to do it. And I'll just like, I'll follow the, the algorithm. I'll follow the formula. I'll follow the structure. Whatever it is you tell me to do, I'll do it. Just don't make me actually work or think. This is why you see students reaching for calculators. Why are they going to start reaching more for, for AI influences and all of those things? It's because the brain wants to expend less energy. I'm going to save my energy for the hunt, for when it really matters. Now, this shows up in our own lives as well, right? This is why we sit on the couch and it's so hard to get up off the couch and to go to exercise. So think for yourself. Let's keep it personal right here for a minute. Think for yourself, what does it take for you to get up off the couch and exercise? Why do you do it? How do you do it? What goes on for you? As you reflect on that, it, for some people, it's, it's some kind of motivation. Like there's some kind of end result that makes me want to do it. For me, I really want to make sure that I, I had children a lot later in life. And I want to make sure that I can hike and bike and play and hang with my kids when they're teenagers. And so for me, like that's, that's what gets me going. It's not because I'm like, oh yeah, I'd love to like get up and go for a long run right now. No, I want to stay on the couch. Like that's natural. That pull for the ease is natural. Um, so it's connecting, to, usually it's connecting to some kind of bigger purpose or some kind of rewards. Like, ah, I know I feel better when I do it and I want to feel better. And so that's how we push up against this ease. But before I'm jumping ahead of myself, let's talk about how you see ease showing up in your with your students right now. So what are the easy pathways that you see them typically seeking out these days? I mentioned a few. What did I miss? I'm just realizing people who are watching the recording are probably like really confused. They won't be able to see the chat and I'm like reading things. I should get canned answers. Using the first, yeah, the first source. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you get it. All of these things. Yep, yep, yep. Because apathy is always going to be easier than effort. And so until we can find ways to help them see the value in the effort, it makes total sense from a biological perspective that we would, that would see apathy. So 
what, here's the big question then. So what could a human centered design for ease be like? How do we honor students' humanity, who they are, and recognize that we are designed to find the easy path? How do we do this? Like maybe the first thought that's coming to your mind is like, oh, we just make everything easy? Wait a minute, that doesn't, that doesn't feel right. What do we do? And, and so you're probably feeling this pull that's really natural in this conversation right now between these first two topics right here. One is we've we still got to keep high expectations. That cheetah is still in them. They still can sprint 75 miles per hour, whatever the their equivalent of that is. Um, and so we want to make sure we keep those high expectations for our students. They are fully capable of doing amazing things. And at the same time, we want to be careful to avoid cognitive load. Now, cognitive load is overstressing the cognitive systems of the brain by too much content at once, too challenging content all at once. We avoid that by some of the, you know, some simple pedagogical tools, things like chunking. I can get my five-year-old, I did it last week, I can get my five-year-old to hike six miles to the top of a mountain through chunking. We take it one little stretch at a time. I don't lower the expectation and say, hey, let's just go hike that little hill over there. Let's like take a lap around the parking lot. I keep the high expectations. We just chunk it. We take it one step at a time. We pause, we take a break, we celebrate, we look how far we've come all the things you know how to do, as well as using really sound pedagogical strategies like multi-sensory instruction. Lectures are a, a thing of the past, really engaging your students in lived multi-sensory experiences. The science behind that and how the brain works, we do not have time for, but it is so robust. Um, I'd really be happy to share that with anybody who has questions about that. So these first two, we want to keep these in balance, like keeping high expectations, but doing it in a way where we avoid cognitive load because students who exhibit cognitive load, which is an overworked working memory, then that shows signs of apathy, disinterest. That's what it looks like on the surface. What it really is, is that we've just overwhelmed their working memory system. Um, and then there is nothing more frustrating, I think, from a student and teacher perspective than forgetting. It is so frustrating for students to give effort, right? If we want them to give the effort and not give in to like sitting on the couch, we want them to give effort, but then they do and then they just forget it. That's so frustrating from a learner's perspective, as well as us as a teacher, we give all this effort to teach and then they forget. Nobody likes reteaching in the spring. It's a giant waste of time. And it just, what, what did I do? What have I been doing for the last six months? And so being able to, this is where like I really get into like the science of learning and the memory systems, motivation systems, when I work with schools to really help them understand, okay, so if we're going to give effort, if we're going to create learning experiences, let's do them in a way that they actually stick and last. This deep meaningful, lasting learning. And so because we only have a short amount of time on that website that I created for you, I just put one of my free books. I've created lots of different free books. You can poke around my website and find them. But this one is specifically around um, memory and remembering things and retrieval exercises that boost learning and retention. There's just like 10 quick ideas in there. You can grab those um, whenever you want to. But let's just pause for a moment and let's talk about this ease and how we can design classrooms and schools where we're holding high expectations, but we're still like, I don't know, honoring or acknowledging or designing within and understanding that oftentimes we just look for the easy way out. What are some thoughts you're having about that? Some questions, some ideas? 
Something I have been thinking a lot about, um, I've been going through brain frames training with Dr. Bonnie Singer, and um, it's six ways to graphically or visually express um, ideas. And it's based on what are kind of the six main things we use language for. So figuring out how to express ideas, I feel like is something that a lot of my students get overwhelmed with. Um, So I think using those like six frames as a standard like thing that we always go back to could be a good routine and a good way to lessen cognitive load. Yeah. Yeah, You could probably reflect on your own practice and find dozens of ways that you already design with this in mind. Uh, At the early elementary level, this is like sentence steps, right? We give them the start of the sentence and then they fill it out. We still hold high expectations. Um, We just scaffold that and, and slowly, gradually build. Our, our reading stamina, our ability to compute um, with more challenging numbers, all these types of stuff. I'll stop talking, keep going. Other thoughts? I think one interesting way is uh, incentivizing the use of AI, but for specific things. A little bit like, yeah, AI is easier. So you can use it to take away some of the time you're spending on meaningless tasks and spend more time on meaningful tasks. I tell my students all the time that I haven't written an email since I discovered ChatGPT. Um, And it's kind of like, this is not a meaningful task that I spend my time on. This is a task that I have to do that requires some basic formatting that spends some time um, that I can use this tool for. And then I told my students, if you want to use AI to start to structure your essay and learn like kind of what a structured essay would look like for this topic, it is you can do that. But I need you to actually look for sources because the sources the AI produces are not um, credible sources. And so you don't know where it's coming from. Mm-hmm. And then the student can spend a lot more time on that and less time on, oh, what do I put first? Right. Right. Love it. Thank you. Yeah, you see how these things are, are working together and reading all the comments here in the chat in terms of uh, like highly relevant and student centered, how that supports the, the principle of ease, because with student choice, we promote more autonomy and then they're more invested and they're willing to, quote unquote, get off the couch and to engage in the work of learning. Like learning requires work. It does. It requires work. And it's a lot of cognitive work. There's also a lot of emotional work involved in learning as well. And so when we can really narrow in and what really matters, if we are very clear on what we believe schooling or this class is about, then we can really narrow in on some purposeful design features in our classrooms. So many great comments in there. I'll check those out a little bit more later. Um, let's talk, let's jump into this third principle right here and ooh, we things might get a little bit hot in here. So just go ahead and take a deep breath, roll your shoulders if you need to. But I mean, I'm probably gonna get real fired up. It always brings up all sorts of emotions. So just let's just ride this roller coaster together and see where it takes us together. Because the third and final operating system that we're going to talk about today By the way, we're only talking about three because of cognitive load, um, making sure that we just work within the structures that the brain has determined for us. We're talking about rewards, folks. We are talking about how the brain is driven toward rewards and away from threats. Why? Because we're designed to survive. We want to stay alive. And so we stay away from threats and we run towards the reward of what it's going to be. So this is why, oh boy, this is why we have an entire school system that is obsessed with grades. You see, when we reward our students with grades, whenever we, whenever we do something well and we get rewarded, let's just go quick to the neurobiology. You do something well, you score a goal in soccer, you get an A on your spelling test, whatever it is, boom, dopamine is released in your brain. You did something well. Dopamine is the the hormone most associated with motivation. It feels really good. It gives this sense of high and your brain's like, woo, that feels good. It gets dispersed, rushes all over your body and brain. You're like, I want more of that. 
And so the brain is smart enough to be like, okay, so how did I get that? Well, I got that feeling by getting an A on my spelling test. So if I want more of that, then I need to go get another A on my spelling test or on my math test or on whatever it's going to be. And so when we associate the reward with a grade or some other type of label or metric, then we are creating a system where students are obsessed with things and consumed with things that are not actually related to learning and growth. That's one small problem, giant problem. The other giant problem is that, well, let's just talk about it. So let's just keep it really simple. You do well, you get a good grade. And so I want to feel that again. And so I need to get that grade again. And so we have actually created this system that we complain about so much, which is students who are obsessed with grades and not the learning. Now, when we associate the dopamine of success of rewards with with grades or, or something else, we're creating not only a challenge for us, but a challenge for future teachers and for the student in general. Because when you study dopamine and rewards, if you ever dive into the research, you're quickly going to land in research around drug abuse because that's where a, so much of the research is found. Because what most people don't understand, most people understand that like, you know, dopamine, we feel good, want more of it. What most people don't know yet that you're about to learn right now is that the brain desensitizes to the dopamine. It wears off, which means in the context of drug addiction, which means that if someone were to start using drugs, they get high, that's dopamine. It's the same thing, exact same neurotransmitter. It's dopamine. We get this, the, you get this high of dopamine. They get this high of dopamine. I don't do drugs. And, um, and then it feels really good and they want more of it. So they go back to that same substance, the A on the spelling test or whatever the drug is, and they, they get more of it. And then they get that high again, but really soon, really soon. And you've seen this in your classroom really soon. It wears off. And now that same drug or that same dose isn't enough. So now I need more. Now I need a higher dose. And eventually I'm going to need a harder drug. What does this look like in classrooms all over the world? It looks like little stickers and little stamps going on little papers in kindergarten and first grade because it gets the job done done. It's like, Ooh, oh, look, hey, I got a sticker. I love stamp. It's not necessarily harmful, but it's like, okay, yeah, hey, yeah, look at this. But what happens is that by second grade, third grade, it's like the sticker. Okay. That, that doesn't do it for me anymore. I need something harder. And so teachers are like, oh, I got to keep them motivated. I got to give them something. It's like, okay. Oh, Here's the treasure box, Oriental trading, the dollar spotted target. I filled it up with all my own money. Here you go. Oh, tokens and systems and go to the treasure box. And like, whoa, what's cool? this little fidget spinner? This is so awesome. And then by like fourth, fifth grade, it's like treasure box. That doesn't get it done for me anymore. I need something bigger. I need something harder. And so then you have teachers who are like tossing out little fun size candy bars to try to get the same result, which is just students giving some effort and caring about learning. They don't care about learning. They care about the reward. They want the reward. And so they're going after the reward, which is the candy, the treasure box, the sticker. But what happens is someone who is taught, I've taught everything from kindergarten through 12th grade, and I've seen it at all levels. By the time you get to middle school, you're using your own money to fund horribly unhealthy donut and pizza parties every Friday. And then in high school, if you hope that this system will continue, it's like you're having to bring in clowns and dunk tanks who are like and clowns who are juggling flaming swords or something every Friday to, to get that same result. You see, if we continue to play a role in this system of rewards, 
then we are helping and to perpetuate a, a system and a society of students, of people who only do things for the value of the reward and not for the inherent value of, of learning and work. So what do we do? Well, I got ahead of myself here. So let's just pause for a couple minutes right here. Like, what, what do you see? What's being rewarded in schools? We need to be reflective and really analyze because so much of it, until we pause and think, like, we're, we're not even aware, like, oh, shoot, I never even thought about it like that. Just because it's what we experienced in school and what everyone else in the building is doing, we're like, oh my gosh, I didn't even realize. <laughs> I'm curious how PBIS is going to fit into this. You can go check my Twitter feed on that one. My kid's school is about to adopt PBIS. And luckily, I'm on the advisory board. I have a few things to say to them. I hope they're not listening to this recording. I love you. Thank you for teaching my children. If you are, that's right. Those stickers don't quite hit the same. Bring out the Lisa Frank. That's hilarious. Yep. Compliance, obedience, compliance. Oh my gosh. All of these inhumane recess. Oh my gosh. Right. The, the, like you, you get to go to recess if you complete your multiplication um, tables within a certain amount of time, all of these things, look at how inhumane all of these things are. <gasps> the appearance of attention. Ooh. Love that. Okay. So you get it. Make sure you take some time to the characteristics of white supremacy culture. Thank you so much. Um, yep. Appearance is a key word here. Make sure you're taking time to read through these chats. Um, so what do we do? Some people are like, oh, but they don't do anything. If, if I don't give them a reward, they won't do anything. The survival and the ease and the reward, they all are interconnected and all working together. I can promise you, I've seen it. I've seen it happen in my own classroom. I've seen it happen at the school. I've started, to, I've started two different schools on my own. I've seen it happen at our schools. I work with a lot of schools around the world. I reform schools. It's possible. It's possible to create a, a joyful, amazing learning experience that doesn't depend on rewards. How do we do it? Well, we are driven by rewards, but what do we reward? If we reward effort and progress, their humanity, just who they are showing up and making progress and learning and growth, not like achievement and grades, daily dopamine, daily dopamine. I, um, <laughs> I should be wearing this. I have this fanny pack right here. Speaking of drug culture, can you see it? It says dopamine dealer. And they're like, depending on the school I'm in, whether I can like get away with wearing it or not. But like, that's how I view my role is it's not that like dopamine is bad or evil. It's amazing. It's great. It keeps us going and doing things. We just have to be really careful. It's a powerful, powerful drug. But instead of like these floods at the end of like a summative assessment or a test, it's like, okay, I think of it more of like an IV drip. How can I just in my interactions with my relationships with my students, with daily formative check-ins and checking in our progress, success checklists where they are self-administering their own dopamine. When you score a goal in soccer, you don't need to look to the sidelines and wait for someone to tell you that you did a good job before you celebrate and get the dopamine. You know you did it. So there's lots of ways you can structure your class and learning so that students are, are not dependent on these external sources. And then boy, oh boy, we got some work to do with evaluating our grading systems. And um, we're still figuring it out. I don't, I don't have, I don't have answers in this area. We're still, people are experimenting with a lot of different things. There's a lot of great ideas out there that um, all seem to have some great characteristics to it and are really intriguing to me, but um, we're working on it. Try some, any, anything is better than what we've got going on right now. So we got a couple minutes left here. Any thoughts here on uh, rewards, questions, observations? I have a question. Yeah. 
I've been big on ungrading for the last three years. Um, and then I taught school. I, I I taught at the university, and I had a very specific experience where uh, most students at the university get A's in the classes, no matter what work they produce. Um, and what happened was interesting to me in that you still had this like distribution of work, but the students who were performing highly at the beginning of the um, of the year started performing badly later on because their work was not being rewarded. And I think that that is an interesting phenomenon. It's not the whole classroom, but it's a, how do you work with that? Yeah. As we continue to evolve in reimagining schooling, we are going to be met with some serious resistance, not just from like systemics and structures, but because of the programming that is embedded, not embedded, the programming that has been reinforced in so many of us. So as a university student who has gone through K through 12 in a traditional setting is so conditioned to work and to learn for a grade, for a letter grade. And so that is, I mean, anytime we try to do anything that's liberating, that is progressive, it's going to take a lot of effort and a lot of, I mean, I would have, I'd be, I would be having a lot of conversations with that class on a weekly basis to remind them. And like, we're going to talk about it. We're going to talk about how we're programmed in this way and why we've been programmed this way and how it serves certain people and certain, um, certain cultures. And so that we can really be aware, right? This is social emotional learning. You start with self-awareness got to be aware. And then you move to self-management. So we know what to manage and how to manage it. Um, man, there's a lot of quick, a lot of great questions who are coming in right here. Activities to healthy ways for students to self-administer dopamine. I mean, I use just like a lot of checklists, like a success criteria of, you know, like, complete this, do this, do this, or we create it together. So what are the steps you need to do to, to do this essay? Okay, great. So you want to have an introductory paragraph. You got to decide on what your title is going to be. Okay, let's write that down. Make a little checklist for yourself. And then when they do it, check, boom. I mean, look at how you feel when you, I mean, how many of you write a to-do list after you've already done half of them, just so you can go back and check off the checklist? We're dopamine like addicts. Like that's why we do it because it feels good. And so it's the same type of principles and that doesn't require any candy, any extrinsic rewards. That's just like, okay, look, hey, I gave effort and it created something worthwhile. That's worth celebrating. That's worth acknowledging. Like that's worth a pat on the back or a little bit of a hit me up. That's inappropriate. A little bit of some dopamine there. Um. Oh, what a lot what a lot of these rewards have in common is that they can be carried rather than stick unless makes them shrink away from them. How can we put rewards without them act as a double-edged sword? Yes. Well, that that's a that's a tricky one. I like I just said, I personally believe that if something's worth learning, then it's worth celebrating. And so we're gonna celebrate that. And celebrations might look like a high five, it might look like a knuckle, knuckle bunk, it might look like eye contact and a wink wink and a thumbs up. It might look like a 30 second dance party. It could look like a lot of things um, that are, yes, all this great stuff on restorative practices is amazing. Lots of different ways um, to, to do this. Yeah. If, can I intercede here yes, for a please, moment, Lisa? I'm sorry. Yeah. I just want to make sure that people are able to um, take, take breaks to kind of, uh, to get away before either engaging in some more asynchronous work with their tracks, getting into the, the next keynote recording or getting ready for the next event. Um, is, is it okay if, uh, okay, nice. I was going to ask if you had anything else to wrap up there. Do you have any closing thoughts, places to send people? Where can people find you if they want to connect and learn more? All of those yeah, things. So, yeah. The best place to find me is Twitter. I mean, I mean, X for now. Yeah. Know. Whatever it is. <laughs> Wherever you can email me, you can find me on my website. Um, here's all the resources I put. I put several things up there for you. Um, my final thoughts is that 
just like learning and growth and joy, it can be found when we create space for the full humanity of our learners. And for us as educators, like this is how we can be showing up in our way um, for in our schools and our homes. And like learning is just so much easier. And teaching is so, so fun, so fun. When we remove these barriers of control and unleash the beauty of how the brain naturally learns, how learning naturally happens. And so thanks so much for letting me be here. Education is the most important profession in the world. Thank you for what you do. And I look forward to connecting you or with you on Discord or on my website or on Twitter, wherever you want to find me. Thank you so much. Snaps, snaps, applause. Well, Thank you so much, Liesl. This was great. And I appreciate you uh, uh, modeling a lot of these uh, things for us as well. So that that was kind of a, an incredible uh, way to run that. So I appreciate that. Um, if people can just stick around here for a minute, I'll just kind of highlight what's happening tonight and maybe then uh, what what you can look forward to um, a little bit tomorrow as well, since for since for a lot of us, we're headed into the evening hours here. So um, the the ne- the last live thing, I guess, that uh, a live big live event uh, will be from 5 to 6 p.m. Eastern time, actually featuring myself and Chris McNutt. Uh, where we'll just talk about, you know, what we're learning by restoring humanity, talk about the work that that we do in schools um, and all of that. Then we'll have a game and network opportunity on Discord uh, from 8 to 9.30 p.m. You can, uh, you know, bring bring a cold drink. Um, if you still uh, want to, you know, cozy up on the couch, a pop-up Discord will be playing uh, some Discord games and, and all of that. And we've made available Cornelius Miner's uh, flipped recorded keynote. So that way you can access that and start to watch and prepare for that Q&A tomorrow. So much going on. <laughs> um, I appreciate all of your uh, extended attention and time and generosity and openness. And again, um, huge thanks to Liesl. So hopefully um, y'all can join um, Chris and I here uh, in another hour as we uh, uh, as, as we'll talk about that. But otherwise... Have a have a good uh, have a good rest of the day, folks.